Senior ASX equities traders Austin Mitchum and Bryce Edwards joined me on stage in Sydney, Australia for a live and private trading event hosted by Chat with Traders. We discuss how we've collaborated on trading from the other side of the world. Bryce and Austin discuss how they work together to make more as like-minded traders. We're going to offer trading advice, tips on how to grow as a trader. We share how to prepare to have your best trading year to date and review some recent trade examples. It's so rare to see seven figure traders share their insights on trading with the trading community in a video like this. So if you're interested in improving your trading by learning from those who are winning big in the markets, then you're going to enjoy this video. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafuri, co-founder of SMB Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic One Good Trade and The Playbook. Click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the trading videos that we're producing for you in the trading community. Special thanks to Chat with Traders for hosting this private event for the trading community and the great work that they do, bringing successful traders to you in the trading community. On a personal note, the best thing that I did in 2018 was start coaching and collaborating select traders outside of our firm. I've become a better coach, expanded my knowledge of markets and my trading network, and most importantly, made new, very close friends. Yes, there's a ton in this video to help you become a better trader, but I hope the biggest takeaway for you is to reach out to others in the trading community and seek to collaborate and learn and learn from other traders so that you become a better trader and a fuller person. I hope you enjoy this video as much as I enjoyed visiting Sydney and Melbourne and working with Austin, Bryce, and chat with traders. Well, let me introduce my guests, which I have with me this evening. Of course, we have Mike Bellafure, all the way from New York City. Uh, Mike is the co-founder of SMB Capital, which is a proprietary trading firm in New York City. Uh, Mike is also the author of One Good Trade and The Playbook, and he's featured on Chat with Traders podcast a couple times. Uh, next to him is Austin Mitchum, who has had an open invitation to appear on the podcast for probably the past two years. Um, somehow Mike convinced him to be up here tonight. <laughs> Uh, Austin is an active equities trader on the ASX and he trades at a Sydney-based hedge fund, uh, Blue Lake Partners. Uh, Bryce Edwards on the end, um, I'm sure many of you are probably already familiar with Bryce. We did an event a little bit similar to this, uh, must have been about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer, and uh, he was on the podcast probably about two years ago. So um, yeah, and Bryce is also uh, very active and uh, highly accomplished. ASX equities trader. I think just by starting, probably a good, a good starting point would be just to ask you, Bryce and Austin, uh, can you just briefly describe your style of trading? I think it's just going to be helpful because we're not going to go through the ins and outs of you know, how you got started in trading and all that sort of thing. Um, but just to give a bit of context for people in the room so they understand probably why you're going to say some of the things you are going to say and you know, your point of view. Sure, I'm a um, ASX short-term trader, uh, specialised in equities. Um, I actually want to step back though, actually, so before I go into how I trade, and just say thank you um, to Aaron for organising this. It's, it's so great to see uh, this many faces. Um, I know some guys who I've spoken to on emails. I've never actually put face to face, so it's um, really nice to, to meet you guys. And the other thing is I'm sort of sitting next to two guys who very much influenced um, my trading career and any success I might have had is very much down to these two guys here. So um, I'm quite humbled to be sitting here and um, it's so nice to be sharing the stage with you two. So, so now moving forward on to your, to your first question, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm an Aussie ASX trader, um, specialising in, in, in equities and primarily, primarily I'm focused on trading stocks with the capital. Um, so that, that's what I'm always focusing on. Um, and in the backdrop, I, I really want to be focusing on buying the strongest stocks and, and selling the weakest stocks. And another layer of that is uh, I'm really quite focused on gathering a information edge. So uh, I try and really leverage people who I think have um, a particular skill set in a particular stock. So might be a broker, it might be an analyst. And I spend a lot of time trying to reach out to those guys um, to pick their minds. So there's a few guys in the audience, um, Will, Al, 
um, that these guys give you great colour in the market. Um, so, is already tested? Yeah, yeah you're good. Um, so, our styles are actually quite similar, but we've got um, a lot of more differences. So, Austin trades for a hedge fund, um, I'm a private trader trading my own capital. Um, the things that are the same, I think, um, uh, we're all trading stocks in play. Um, stocks are, are going to move the most on any one day. Um, so there's generally a big catalyst, changing, changing fundamentals in the stock. Um, and so as a day trader or an intraday trader, um, you generally need to be in stuff that's moving a lot. Um, and you know, so if we have that in common, we're often in the same stocks each day, but we've got quite a different skill set. Um, Austin can leverage um, information um, you know, out there in the market through brokers and whatnot. I'm sitting at home. Most of my intel comes from Austin and other guys in the chat room. Um, my skill set is a little bit different to Austin's in that um, you know, it's predominantly around tape reading and reading the audible. Um, I tend to be quite reactive, um, whereas Austin is much more methodical and planned. And so while we'll be trading similar stocks, um, our styles are slightly different. Um, you know, he's trying to go for a big intraday trend, whereas I might be flipping around in the audible in and out throughout the same stock during the day. And I think, Mike, it would be interesting to hear from you as well, uh, just so everyone in the room has uh, some context about where you're coming from, is uh, the type of trading that you do at SMB and also the type of traders that you work with. First of all, Austin also wanted to thank his dad and his wife. <laughs> for, uh, for, we kid a lot. We actually know each other quite well. Uh, and then also, if you didn't actually win the raffle, it wouldn't kill you guys to actually go to Amazon and, and buy it. <laughs> Amazon.com, you might have heard of it. Um, and so, we are a short-term active trading desk. We trade equities, we trade a lot of options, we trade a little bit of futures, uh, we do some automated trading as well. Uh, we trade in teams. And so, teams are made up of people who gravitate towards styles that are best for their cognitive and their personality strengths. So these two guys up here are very successful, um, but have different cognitive and personality strengths and attack markets differently. At our firm, they would sit on different desks and do different things. So there are guys who do a lot of scalping. There are guys that uh, are really good at information plays, m and there are, we have an international arm desk. Uh, we have guys who focus on low flows. We have guys who focus on options. We have guys who focus on marketplace. So there are different trades with edges in US markets, and we try and cover a lot of them and place people appropriately. Okay, well, as you brought up teams, I think maybe one of the first subjects that we could get into is actually maybe talking about teams, but maybe more so collaboration because I know Mike and Austin, you two work together quite closely and uh, Bryce has sort of looped into that as well. Um, how come, how are you working together? What's, what's the idea there? Yeah, so it, it, it really began, um, I think, uh, at the start of last year. Um, I had a good year uh, and I really wanted to push the boundaries and get even better. And one of the biggest things, one of the biggest teachings that Mike always has is this concept of this growth mindset, this concept that you can be better. So I very much sought Mike out and said, look, Mike, I you know, admire, admire what you do. Um, I've read all your books and um, you know, I very much want to improve my trading. So, so Mike said, well, look, the, the biggest success we've seen in, in New York is this report card. It's been you know, the, the catalyst for so many successful traders at our firm. So, he said, let's begin that. Let's begin that relationship and let's focus on one goal um, that you that you think will, will, will really push you forward next year. So that's how we began. I would write this report card, we'd focus on one goal, and and Mike would give me feedback. And and in time it became quite clear that Mike didn't actually know many of the stocks that I was trading. He wasn't quite aware of some of the liquidity issues that might be happening. So he said, Well look, let's loop in. You know your best friend Bryce. Let's get him in here. Um, so that's how that relationship began. And Bryce very much would also be part of this chain, um, giving feedback, uh, and that's really how the relationship began. And we've been going for about a, about a year now. So I think one of 
the most interesting things that we could get into on the subject is probably talking about, you know, you said you had a good year, but you wanted to get better. You wanted to put this growth mindset into play. Uh, what were some of the things which you actually have worked on with Mike? And maybe Mike can uh, give his point of view as well. Um, well, the, the first thing we really worked on was uh, sizing. So, you know, I, I hit a point when I knew my best setups. I, I knew what the best catalysts were. I, I knew the ideas that I wanted to play. So, so Mike really was trying to make me push the boundaries of, of what I can see was possible. So, and it's very small baby steps, very systematic to make you feel more comfortable um, getting big, but not too uncomfortable. Um, so that's the first thing we worked on. And then in time, it just sort of migrated to other things that, that I felt like I needed to address. So at the moment, I'm working on being more self-aware. I've been over-trading. Um, I think in November, December, I get rid of money back. So I, I thought, well, let's be more self-aware. Let's focus on that particular goal. Um, so there's been many goals along the way that we've worked on. And once we feel that we've ticked that one off, um, we're moving on to the next one. And that's what the trading, I think, is is really all about. It's not about you know having this particular edge. It's really about constantly developing these skills, constantly pushing these skill sets, and then once you feel comfortable with those skill sets, trying something different, or moving on, sorry, to the, to the next skill set. Yeah, I thought one of the really important things that uh, at the beginning I was hoping to accomplish was, uh, and it's fine because Bryce and, and Austin are, are very different and they have different skill sets. And you know, Bryce, I, I get the impression, could kind of probably wake up 10 minutes before the opening, <laughs> roll out of bed and make $15,000 trading some three letter symbols. <laughs> um, and, and Austin is, is uh, more like me. Um, he has, and, and in time, and, and he's planned my entire trip for me, minute by minute, for, for eight days. <laughs> I didn't find this though. You would think that I got the point that, like, you know, I could probably figure out some of this stuff. <laughs> but uh, what I, one of the things I really wanted to do uh, after I learned some more about them was, and it ties into this event, and I hope it ties into what you really take away from something like this. I hope you guys really take away from us a really valuable lesson, which is we're three people who are successful in our own ways, totally around, totally all the way around the world. We don't trade the same markets, we don't trade the same stocks, we don't trade the same way. But we have found a way to find value from each other. So you all sit here and you know drink our drink sparks beer and eat the food. But what's really important in terms of a lesson to take away is that we are reaching out to other people to push ourselves to be better. And we talked about this. So one of the great books I read recently was Phil Knight, co-founder of Nike's biography, Shoe Dogs, where he wrote, Grow or Die. And for those of you who don't know, Nike was real close to dying for the first 15 years of existence. And now it was this huge, I mean, they were so close many times going into business. In fact, the way they stayed in business is just so a lark. And, you know, the three of us, have developed friendships, and we learn from each other, and we are all better because of that. And so one of the things I was hoping to do was get, you know, Mr. I can roll out of bed five minutes before the open to really start giving his feedback to Austin because I could see that that would be really valuable for both of them. And I can see Austin really helping, and I can see Bryce really helping Austin, and the two of them better for that. So, you know, and I reach out to people. Some people are not gonna write back, 
I spend a little bit of each day reaching out to somebody new or a couple people new. And some of those people, they fucking don't write back. <laughs> you know. But some of them do. And I don't worry about those other people. And it, it adds a lot of value to your life. Now we're going to stay on the subject of collaboration for a little bit longer, but one of the things you brought up before Austin was uh, sizing. You wanted to increase size, and that's something which Mike and obviously um, Bryce has uh, helped you with to some extent. Um, can you maybe walk us through how you did go about increasing size, and like when to increase size, sort of the process you used? Because I know there's going to be people in this room who are like, and even myself to a certain extent, I know there are certain trades where I do better and I feel like I have an edge in certain types of plays, but how do I actually, you know, really step it up and make that really um, a home run type of trade? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, Bryce is a very natural risk taker, and I think that's why he is very successful. And the biggest thing I learned from him is really understanding what opportunity or what catalyst is meaningful enough to go for it. So you know, if you just have any other average, say, catalyst like a broker upgrade, fine. If you have a broker upgrade and it's an earnings upgrade, you've got another variable there. If you have that plus the stocks breaking out from a, from a chart level, you've got another variable there. So it's trying to build as many variables as you can to then understand, okay, this really is the best trade I have today. This really is the A plus trade today. And something Mike always taught me is that, you know, I don't care if I'm now wrong. My, my job as a trader is now to allocate as much capital as I can to my best ideas. I've got four variables here. So, and that's what, that's just gotta be the starting point. Starting point has gotta be, is this my best idea? And then it becomes about, okay, this is my best idea, what? do I feel comfortable risking on this trade? And start with a number that is not going to scale you. So, you know, perhaps thinking with I was $3,500, okay, and I'm going to buy the stock here, I'm going to add into it, and where am I wrong? You've got to understand what my idea is and where am I wrong. And that's the position size of that. And then in time, if you feel more comfortable, then I'm risking $5,000 on this idea. I'm risking $7,500 on this deal. So you've got to slowly, slowly progress into it. And I feel like it's a system to, to, to get to that point. And through time and experience the market, you do just know the ones that really you need to go for and the ones that are a, 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 a B minus setup. So it's an incremental step. Um, Bryce uh, probably will have a slightly different answer to that one. Yeah, well, um, with sizing, I mean, when we're talking about these big catalyst trades, in particular, I mean, we can get into talking about breaking news trades a little bit later on. You know, many of you will know, with the ASX, um, most of the news comes forward from the company um, through the ASX uh, news platform. Um, the company goes into a halt. Um, you know, it, it goes from points. Then typically, if it's a big change in fundamentals catalyst, you'll get a gap up. So the market gets a chance to read the announcement, prices in there and the stock gaps up or gaps down accordingly. Breaking news trades, um, you know, it's something that we've been working together on. Um, Austin's got this information edge. Um, these types of trades are where the catalyst comes outside of the ASX market platform, which means it's either media or, um, you know, Bloomberg might have reported on something. Um, you know, this example that we'll talk about a little bit later with Afterpay, there's a Senate inquiry into buy now, pay later, um, financial um, you know, arrangements. Any of these catalysts, or a Trump tweet, um, anything that comes outside, um, there's a huge potential for you to get a lot of size and know that there's more order flow coming in behind you. So those are the types of trades that we've been working um, you know, a lot on, and they're the type of trades where you can move first, and rather than stop gapping up, you know, there's a trend. Um, the stock doesn't halt for that time, and that's something that's been really powerful. And they're the types of events that um, we really need to be made to side. I just want to have one more thing to, to answer the question. Um, you know, how are you going to get bigger in your best ideas, Aaron? Um, how can you size better? It, it, it comes back to this concept of being very self aware as well. So, if the trade's working, 
you, you need to step away and ask yourself, like, have I put enough risk here? Is this doing everything that my best trades do? Is it working for me and doing what all my examples are showing? Me? So if you're very self-aware, then it's actually quite easy to, to get bigger in these ideas. Um, when you get caught up in the emotion of the trade, that's when you're not thinking these things through. So, so step back, be self-aware, and ask yourself some key questions. Am I big enough? Where should I add? Where am I wrong? That's how you, that's how you incrementally bump up your size. Just to pull you up on that last point there, how do I know when I'm wrong? How do you know when you're wrong? So I probably have you know, three or four different types of setups, let's call it. And say in one scenario, I'm, we won't use Bryce's scenario, say, say I'm playing the morning drive, which means inherently I'm going to be buying the open print or soon off the open print. Well, that's, that's use what I did with Mike on Monday as an example. Oh, okay, so the stock gap's up, okay? And the stock holds the open gap, and then it breaks the high, and then it starts driving. Where am I wrong? Well, I'm wrong the minute this stock now goes back below that open print. I'm minute wrong that stock cap goes back below the low of the day. If my idea is that this stock is going to keep driving, that's one particular example. So it, it comes back to what is your play, and where is your play invalidated? If you're playing an afternoon breakdown through a range, well, you know when you're wrong, the stock gets back above that range. I'm talking intraday specifics. If you're playing a daily chart, and the whole idea was that the stock was, you know, a turnaround play, and it doesn't stop turning around, well, you know you're wrong. So it's about fitting that particular play that you're trying to, to do, and understanding what that's invalidated. Is there anything you'd like to add on the subject, Ron, about the size? <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of developing traders overvalue the importance of sizing. What's What comes before sizing? What's way more important than sizing for a developing trader? I'm hearing it in there. Speak louder. Consistency. Yeah, consistency. Consistency. And so I think a lot of developing traders or guys who are underperforming think the reason why they are underperforming is because they're not trading big enough in a trade here and there. And the thing that we work on with our guys is first to be consistent. Those are very different goals. But if you can get to be consistent, even with a little bit of money, we've seen guys go from making $4,000 a month to making over $2 million net in a year, doing the same thing. That's how powerful being consistently profitable is. But if you are sitting there trying to hit home runs in, in, in particular trades and putting a lot of risk on, and you don't yet have a decent playbook, a, a decent amount of setups to be able to go to, to be able to make money consistently, well, don't worry about sizing. Worry about consistency. So maybe that's something that we should talk about. I know uh, from seeing Bryce and Austin, that's not really something you struggle with. I mean, maybe there are times when you do struggle with that, but we definitely struggle with it. Do you want to speak about that? I mean, that's, that's the nature of the markets. I mean, if we, if we talk about what's happening right now, I, I think a number of trades that Bryce and I used to do just don't work anymore. Um, and th there's, there's, there's one real thing that tells you that your your agent stop working, it's like you're losing money. And sometimes it's very hard to to step back and, and really evaluate that. And that's once again the importance of report cards. It's like, well, Mark, I took my best trade, didn't work. I took my report card, this day, took this best trade, didn't work. But at some point, the market's kind of telling you that that's, you know, that edge has stopped working, or that particular setup or strategy has stopped working. And you know, I certainly felt it in November uh, and December. Um, and so the solution has to be. To, to write it down. The solution has to be to analyze your trades. Um, you know, my win rate is 55%. Um, you know, when I'm trading well, you know, the money I make with the fact that I made. So I spend a lot of time, you know, evaluating where I'm going wrong and why. Yeah, I'd be much the same. I mean, because I've come from a scalping background, I often times find that when I'm struggling to make money, I try and then revert to scalping. Um, because it's, you know, the big money's obviously not scalping, but 
the market turns like it did in November and December. And you know, we both trade long and short, but it's notoriously difficult to short sell when the markets are collapsing. You usually get big gaps there, gap downs. Um, shorting is extremely hard. Um, and so when the markets are really volatile like that, it gets a liquid, um, yeah, it's frustrating. Things are whipping everywhere. And so for me, the consistency is really just to fall back into scalping, um, size down, and uh, you know, just being a lot shorter term. Uh, but it's less volatile. Yeah, I want to point out something really important that Austin said. He said that my win rate is 55%. How many people know what their win rate is? So a professional trader tags their trades, measures their trades, and can tell you what their win rate is. They can tell you what times of the day they trade the best. They can, they can tell you what their best trades are because they've taken them and they've measured them. And they're doing the work. And so one of the things that I love about working with Austin is that I will come up with a suggestion. For instance, I'll say, okay, you're overtrading a little bit during the middle of the day based on your feedback. Let's take some breaks during the day. Let's take a break three times during the day for a little bit of time. And that is going to be our solution to over trading in the middle of the day. And, you know, I will sit back and wait. And Austin will say, within an hour, I'm done. I've automated the process. I've got it linked to my uh, calendar. It pops up and when, I was, when I was there. Sure enough, he showed me, you know, at, at, at this time, my alert pops up, don't over trade at this period of the time. And so he's, he's, he's telling you, please understand what he's, what he's saying. He knows exactly what his stats are, and he's doing extraordinary work. You know, if, if I were to give a project to improve their trading of all of the people in this room, he's going to be in the top 1% in terms of thoroughness and diligence of his work. And that matters to a lot of people. It doesn't matter to everyone. There are some people who, who just have it and they're better off being laid back and you know one of my one of my top guys I sort of said this and maybe we shouldn't say it on camera. But uh, you know there are guys that also stroll in ten minutes before the bell opens and uh, I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> but there are there are talented people who who don't. But most of the people need to match in a competitive marketplace that diligence, that conscientiousness, that work ethic. When you talk about someone just strolling in like that, I mean, they weren't doing that from day one, though, were they? Sure, I think they are, and, and so <laughs> I think they are. At least they are. It, it's a really interesting point, and Dr. Steinbarger, who is a must follow, he writes a blog, Trader Feed, he writes for Forbes, he uh, works with our traders. How many people know who Dr. Steinbarger is? Yeah, okay. Everybody knows who Dr. Steinbarger is. So, uh, we've been talking about this idea of conscientiousness. Right now, we're, we, we just finished our yearly goals. So, we bring our traders in, in teams, and they've done their yearly goals for the year, and each trader presents in front of their team leader, myself, Dr. Steve Barger, our risk manager, what their yearly goals are, where they want to be, how they're going to get there, what's their process, what are the numericals. And the people write reports. It is striking to us the difference in those reports. You know, some people, present 35-page PDF files. I want to go from a million dollars to $2.5 million. Here's my 35-page PDF files, how I'm going to do it. Aaron, that guy's going to do it. You know, he has the edge, he's going to do it. And then, you know, some other people will come in and say, I'm struggling, I'm underperforming, here's my page. 
of my yearly review, and here's my two ideas, which are barely mapped out of how I'm going to do better, usually that doesn't cut it for, for lots of people. So you're talking a lot here about writing reports, and I guess it all comes under the banner of reviewing how you're trading and identifying areas where you can improve. When you talk about putting together a report of some form, maybe what, what's some of the details which should go into those reports and things which are necessary to, uh, you know, document for labour reflection? Um, Bryce. Bryce. <laughs> Well, I mean, as I say, I've been working on um, this report card, um, you know, for the past year. Um, there was a period through, uh, I think it was May, June, that, you know, I was, um, you know, doing these report cards purely on my A-plus trades. And the goal for me was just simply to do, uh, or to make my best trades and be bigger in them and try and hold them for longer. Um, so that was the main thing that I was working on. And I think it's pretty important to really nail down one or two particular goals. Um, Austin's report card, you know, there's a number of questions that he writes at the top of the report card that he's going to focus on for, you know, a couple of weeks until he nails that down. So I think, you know, picking off specific goals, um, you know, and, and really focusing on those until you know them before moving on is something that's pretty important. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite thorough in terms of what I'm trying to, to detail. So I'll write something daily, I'll write something monthly, and I'll write something yearly, and um, the metrics we're looking at, um, there's all kinds of things. I mean, ultimately, p &L is is important, but it's, it's not really feel end all. Um, the things that matter to me are things like, what is it? it's called profit factor, what's my win loss ratio, how big are my winners versus my losers, am I making enough in those really great trades? So that's definitely one metric that I'm definitely looking at. Um, it's simple. My win weight loss rate is very important. How much am I making in the the in a monthly review? Say I'll go say what were the, the biggest movers on catalysts? How well did I do in those stocks? And then I'll print out those charts and I'll go over them all. So that's that's another example of the sort of the intricacies of um, the, the the stats that I'm trying to get. I I use. Um, a platform called TraderView, which might be in touch with, um, which these US guys do. And there's all kinds of things you can pull apart, but I'm very much guided by the things that I think are relevant, as I said before, with those win loss ratios, biggest winners, biggest losses, um, turnover levels, um, full structure on my report goal might be. Did you want to add something on? Sure. Uh, it depends. It depends on where you're at. And I think that the reality is most people are at the stage where they're developing. And so developing traders tend to need to work on their routine. What's going to be your daily routine to improve so you become a consistently profitable trader? And that, that entails a lot of things, like what time are you going to go to sleep? Are you going to exercise? Are you going to do mindfulness training? Are you going to do a, a playbook trade, which I wrote about in the playbook, every day? Are you going to do a daily report card? Are you going to import your trades into TraderView? Are you going to talk to other traders about trading? Are you going to keep a daily journal? Are you going to keep your trading stats? And so you work on a daily routine to build your business and chip away at doing those things uh, one by one. And then, you know, elite guys, they're working on different things. They've got their daily routine down. They're working on being broader. Can I add a new edge? They're working on how do I express my ideas in different ways? And they're setting goals uh, for things like that. Okay. So, I guess, you know, for Austin, Bryce, you know, you guys are in a pretty good situation where you're both doing well as traders, you know, you're speaking with Mike on a daily. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in here who are upcoming traders still trying to find their way, developing traders, right? How can they take some aspects of what you guys have going on and use that to help them get better as traders? As in, 
on the collaboration side of things? Um, well, I would say find someone with a slightly different um, skill set or niche. Um, you know, we're kind of worlds apart um, in terms of our skill set and our personality, but we train we trade in similar fashion. Um, so when we first met, Austin was predominantly looking at uh, static chart platforms. Um, you know, um, was a momentum trader. Um, I was using the Spark platform. My edge was really about tape reading and reading the order book. And so, you know, I was helping Austin a lot with the tape reading and the order flow. Uh, and then he was working at um, Blue Lake and had built up a really good network of institutional brokers. Um, got a really good understanding of how institutional flow works. Um, and you know, I'm just a retail trader um, scalping around. You know, when I need to get in and out of the market, um, I can do it in one or two prints. You know, but institutions, when they sell or when they buy, they keep selling and selling and selling. They've got a lot of stock to move. Um, and so this concept of institutional flow was something that uh, Austin helped me really understand in order to, you know, ride those winners for a little while longer. So, you know, if you've got um, other trading friends with, um, you know, different, uh, skill sets and it's really good to collaborate and I think you know uh, about two or three years ago that's something that really helped me I and mean, we used to have this phrase that we always used to say um, if anyone's seen the, the documentary called Trader um, Paul Tudor Jones that was filmed back in the 1980s great um, great documentary it's on YouTube uh, there's one particular scene um, and he's sort of huddled over the phone the market's puking and he's going, giving some broker an order for sell. He's like, sell 120, sell 120. And he says, more behind it. You know, and that those three words, more behind it, it just sums up this whole concept of institutional flow. And uh, you know, when we're in a position, and uh, you know, I'm watching every tick on on um, on the order book, thinking, oh, should I cover? Oh, should I cover? Um, Austin's like, more behind it. Sit on your hands, try and ride out the the bigger trend. Um, and so this is through collaboration and different skill sets. I think you, you know you probably benefit in um, um, you know finding people that have different skill sets. So yeah, to answer that, that question as well. So I was very much developing when I met Bryce. Like I, I, I did not make money when I first met Bryce, and he was already doing it. And I, I basically watched his chat room and and, and would see his skill set, and I just sought him out, and we became friends, and we talked. I mean, collaborative by our chat room, and, and it was through Bryce that my eyes opened a bit this concept of price action, this concept of watching the order. And that was the layer I needed for the charts, for everything else that, that Bryce has mentioned. So, you know, that, that, was, that was everything to me. That was where my, my journey really began. You know, Mike's concept of stocks and play, plus Bryce's skill set with um, the price action, it, it is where I really formed my whole edge. So, I was developing when I um, met Bryce, and so my answer to your question, what I think you should do if you're developing is seek out somebody who you admire, seek out someone who I think is offering something that you're very interested in. There's so many avenues now. There's, there's Twitter, there's chat rooms, there's you know, emails. I mean, I email, email Mike, I had never met him before, and I was in New York um, on holiday, um, my wife and I actually got engaged in that trip. Um, Mike didn't know me, he took me out for lunch. I actually gave him, uh, he actually signed for me in the playbook. And um, he, he actually addressed it to Bryce, and it's a bit romance, but when I got back, I actually gave it to Bryce and said, um, will you be my best man? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's the collaboration, you know? I hadn't met Mike, um, and I went out and just did it. So. Developing traders, you've just got to find people who you admire. You've got to find the people who are doing it, and and be hungry enough to, to go and network with those people. Can I point out one thing about Bryce? So you describe yourself as I'm just this retail trader out there doing it. You know, when you're looking for people to learn from, I do a lot of interviews. We hire traders. <coughs> When I talk to Bryce, and, and you, you may not pick up on this right away, but when I talk to Bryce, I can see by the focus that he has, how unique it is, by the clarity of his thoughts, 
how unique that is by the incredible fast processing power that he has and how unique that is such that he has taken his cognitive strengths and he's matched it with his trading techniques. He's a scalper. He's a tape reader. Those, that type of brain power, and there's different types of, of mental acuity, and there's different types of personalities. We have traders who make seven figures who don't think that quickly. We would not push them to scalp. But if you're going to go learn from Bryce, and you're not as, as fast as he is, good to add price action to your trading, but maybe think about you're going to need a little bit more than just price action because you've got a different skill set, you've got a you've got a different engine than than he does. And I would say to Bryce, you know, you probably shouldn't be a global macro trader. That's not your skill set. And so that's that's super important. Just before we move off this subject of collaboration, I think maybe one last thing we should chat about is having rigid beliefs, like any rigid beliefs that uh, you perhaps had before kind of being open to ideas from each other. Is there anything which comes to mind? Um, yeah, I mean, I hold a few beliefs and those beliefs can be proven wrong, but they give me a framework to operate within. And, and, and for me, that's quite important. And as I said at the start, you know, a big part of my trading is buying the strongest stocks and selling the weakest stocks. And I was with Mike on Monday, and he goes, how are you going to trade this? And I was like, well, when it gets to the high, I'm going to buy more. And he goes, what happens if it pulls back? And I was like, well, I'm just going to wait for it to go back up, then I'll buy more. And he was like, but you're always buying the new high. And I was like, well, that's just what I feel comfortable with. And that is a belief based on, I think, watching the screens from watching how strong stocks move. It's how I feel comfortable. So I definitely need to be able to um, perhaps understand that's not necessarily the right way to trade, but it's, it's what um, gives me a framework to operate within. So you do have to be flexible. You do have to understand what you're wrong. But I, I believe there are certain um, frameworks or guiding forces that, that need to hold firm to your particular style. Another thing that I just don't do is I just don't buy I just don't buy dumps. I just don't buy capitulation. Mike has CC been with a very, very successful US trader, and that is one of his primary strategies. And the whole concept was for Mike to make me understand that there's another one out there that I can that's with someone who's doing it very successfully. So we I've used that information to tailor it to what I do, which is say I'm short and it stops capitulating. I'm using that to cover a lot better. But I still hold that belief that I don't want to be the guy fighting flow. I don't want to be the guy picking bottoms. It's not necessarily right, but it's something that works for me. Um, so that's that's my take on um, certain beliefs that I hold. Um, one thing I will also add is having seen price trade um, very successfully is that you've got to be able to adapt. So I've said all that stuff about having these beliefs, but you've got to be able to adapt. Got to be able to understand when you're wrong, um, and that's when this belief thing goes out the window. So um, you've got to adapt the patterns that you're seeing, especially when things aren't working. Yeah, I can't say that. I mean, as far as rigid beliefs, I mean, I'm always fairly flexible, and you know, the one thing that I've found, particularly when I was starting trading, is that um, you know, one of the first, um, I guess, pieces that I needed to give away was um, you know, building conviction. You know, when I first started, I was sort of trying to find my style, and uh, you know, I, I built convictions every time I wanted to place a trade. And you know, because we're winning half the time, um, inevitably, when you have to fold and and take a loss in something, I just found it really, really difficult. So the less conviction um, that I had before I entered a trade, I just found it much easier. Um, and so I've always been quite flexible, and I'm pretty comfortable going. Um, big without a really big conviction because I'll just turn around and cut the trade. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I am not really rigid in my beliefs at all. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you brought up that example of buying um, 
capitulations because I know uh, Bryce and I had spoke about that as possibly it's being just, a... It's just a very hard trade. I, I just don't think people have built have enough experience to make that trade. Um, you know, and, and inherently what happens is if it stops dumping and it does start bouncing, people just get out straight away. So you're, you're risking a lot to make a very small because they're very uncomfortable. Some people are good at it and that's fine, but I think when you're starting, and, and Mike will bring this forever, but when you're starting, you just want to do one or two things well. And I'm telling you, fading and buying pigeon is the hardest thing there is. So do one or two real simple things well, earn the right to then try a new play, try a new play, and a new skill. But yeah, stick to the simple stuff first and do the simple stuff well. Yeah, I, I don't know why a lot of people get convicted about certain things, particularly when they're starting out. I mean, well, what the hell do they know? And I'll say it more eloquently. So there's two different types of edge. There's edge where you know you, you can predict a move is about to happen or a market move is about to happen. You, you, you have that edge. You have a, a news edge that you can place in the marketplace. And there are other people who observe what's going on in the marketplace and derive an edge from observing what's going on in the marketplace. Let's take the people that really have a news edge and really can't predict what's going on, okay? Versus what uh, some of you might have as a retail trader and, 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 and a step further, a developing retail trader. No, you can't. They can uh, call up a hammer in the name and talk to him about their work and, 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 and what their views are. Can you do that? An edge is not, I read an article on Bloomberg.com and I decided that a particular company is going to do well. That is not a news edge. That's an opinion. That's a thesis. You don't build a career off of that. You end a career off of that. It's not an edge. And so, if you don't have that, you know, which is, that's the way that our firm trades, by the way, we don't have a news edge, we have an observation edge, then become good at that. Then find to develop a thesis reading an article on Yahoo. But then look for a setup in your playbook that makes sense to you and get in at a good price. Okay, and set good risk reward trades for that and see it. We talk a lot about that. See it. See the confirmation on the tape after you learn tape reading skills. That then can become one good trade, that can become a profitable trade. That's that's something you can turn into edge as an observation trader. And most of the short term active traders are observing observation traders. I'd like to go through some specific trades, if possible. Uh, maybe we can talk about how you trade. I know you mentioned Afterpay earlier, and I'm sure a bunch of people in the room are probably familiar that Afterpay has been in play the past couple of days uh, for various things. On Friday they had uh, a company update, and then uh, today was the beginning of um, uh, was it a Senate hearing of some sort. Um, is that something you comfortable talking about how you trade? Yeah, I think I think the trade that we do want to talk about after, but I think the trade we wanted to talk about was actually back in November and October when um, you know these events started hitting the tape. I mean, Bryce, do you want to take this one away? Yeah, well, we're not, not, not talking about the one on Friday, but last year. Yeah, well, um, this is what I was referring to before about a break of news trade. So. Um, you know, this particular news event, um, there was a Senate inquiry into this buy, uh, buy now, pay later um, finances. And, um, you know, it must have been two o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, I don't know where else I got the news from, I don't want to put it as a broker, but the news um, came through a channel outside the ASX, and so huge amounts of volume get done on the tape, and the stock, the stock spikes, and it's really, really illiquid. And so those are the type of trades that, um, you know, if you know that there's flow coming and there's, um, you're the first person to the news and there's no halt, um, then people are just going to pile in behind you. Um, and so Austin um, managed to get his hands on the information pretty quickly. Yeah, it was, it was specifically that 
the ACCC had sent their recommendations to the Senate, and then basically the wording was that they were okay with how the business operated. That was the conclusion by a certain broker who's, who's um, the bull of the name. And at the time, the stock was trading 11 monies, 12 bucks. So very simply, that this company was actually, uh, all, all the all the short piece and everything was slowly falling apart on that, on that one headline. Yeah, and there was a good short base, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, any time there's a big short base, um, you know, there's, there's opposing pieces on the stock, um, shorts being built up, those guys are going to get squeezed, so um, this was a, a high beta name, um, and there was a news catalyst to sort of get in front of, so. So how did you actually trade that? Obviously you saw, where did the article come from? Was it ACCC website? Exactly, and, and someone had obviously public information, someone's obviously taken it and then put their uh, spin on the report. Now it's a detailed report, so that's the other thing that's really important with these trades is is a lot of the times the market, you know, the fund manager has to take time to read this whole report, right? And that creates this uncertainty, that creates this, this opportunity for traders because you're a fund manager, you've got to read 85 pages and then you've got to allocate 50 million bucks to this trade. It's going to take time. And that's why these events flow. And, and the same thing happened on Friday. So Arthur Payne came out with a business update at 9.45 a.m., 9.50. Um, and an example was it was um, Pete was in the audience, you know, he, he was long stock and he had a meeting. And he had to get back to the office to read it and work out what to do. So it creates this um, this 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 edge where this this flow this 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 time period whereby you as a trader you can make a, a quick decision you can see the flow and you can sit and you can wait and you can watch that flow and in this example back in November we were quite quick onto it and I remember speaking to Bryce Bryce called me on the mobile actually and since he was a bit flustered because obviously it caught way too many and he goes do you think this is it do you think this is it and I, and I said well just talk out loud about it. And so we sat there, and even though the thing was flying around, he said, talk to me about it. And he just went through the five variables. You know, it was late in the afternoon, no one had read it, there's a massive short base, it's breaking out, it's a strong stop. You know, we, we know these guys are performing. And he put the phone in and went, cool, I'll. And he made another 50, 60 cents on the upside. So, you know, um, my point, sort of a bit off, off, off tangent there, but, the best trades are ones with multiple variables. The best trades when there's the market takes time to digest this news event. Yeah, actually, just to add a, a point on that, I've got another example from today. Um, but this concept of getting being first to the news as an intraday trader, I mean, that, that's the best chance you have. Um, and to give you another example, I mean, we, we spoke about breaking news plays where the news comes from outside the ASX platform. There's other scenarios where the news comes through the ASX platform. Um, but it comes right on the belt. So this morning there's a company called Aurelia Minerals, um, AMI, it's a gold and copper miner. Um, they released, um, I don't know if it was a quarterly or something, right at 9.59, market opens at 10. So at 9.59, um, if you're a broker, um, you know, or a portfolio manager, you're getting ready to trade in and out of all these things that you've already prepared for. And so when someone drops an announcement at 9.59, People scrambling, doing other things, dealing with their portfolio, no one really has time to read. You know, so the stock halts for 10 minutes and it resumes at 10.09. Now usually, if an announcement comes through at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, people digest it. You get a much bigger gap and less, less trend. If you get an announcement that comes through at 9.59, I guarantee you the gap is going to be a lot smaller and the trend is going to be bigger because it takes people much longer to get to the stock and decide to sell. And so for AMI, for example, last trade I think it closed yesterday at 80.5 cents. Um, today it opened at uh, 78, so it only gapped down 2.5 cents, and then it drove a whole 10%. So that's a trade will move versus a gap, you know, gaps up, flushes around with it. Um, so this whole concept of, um, you know, being first to the print before the rest of the market moves is extremely powerful. I just want to add one final thing, um, which goes back to what we said, the concept of report cards. It's not suddenly like Bryce and I are just magically doing these things. We have 
talked about these trades every single day on our report card. So this, after being back in November, was actually the second time this had happened. So we felt like we were watching exactly the same rerun, but in reverse, and the previous occasion the stock was dumping because there was concern that the Senate would, would um, be quite negative. This time, it was the complete opposite. So we'd seen this play out. Right, and it's, it's through that repetition, it's through writing a play, it's through all that hard work you do that in real time, you're like, I've been here before, I, I've seen this before. There was a time when you know, me and Bryce were, we traded AMP a lot, and then another headline hit AMP, we did the same trade but bigger, we did it in Telstra. So it's about that constant repetition, that constant um, feedback people were getting from each other, and then Mike in the background was just sort of saying, where can you get bigger? Where can you get bigger? What can you do better? Um, and that's where I think it's, it's people don't do that enough. But that's the hard work. That's the deliberate practice. That um, that the next time opportunity comes, you, you've been there before, so you can better execute and you can better make a plan. The example you gave just before price was it AMI this morning? Yep. Yep. AMI. So I'm uh, just thinking back. I think it was just before Christmas. Um, was it bigger cheese? Bigger VGA yep. did a very similar thing. Uh, released a company update um, at like two minutes after the open, and it just dropped <laughs> yeah. like a rock. Yeah, and those moves tend to be tradable versus gaps, which is the best thing about um, you know upgrading this type trade. Can we just talk about uh, Afterpay a little more as it's sort of a current event? Um, how did you trade it on Friday? Because I know there was a stock that was very much yeah, like this um, to you. Bryce, were you trading on Friday? Yeah, I think I did, yeah. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry, just, just to be clear, there was a company update on Afterpay on Friday. It, it, it's actually a stock I know quite well because my wife loves the business. And um, <laughs> she was the first one who actually told me about this stock when it was trading for dollars and we bought some PA for it, which was a bit of fun. But, but back to the trading, um, it's a stock I know um, quite a bit about. Um, it's a stock that someone had, uh, had been uh, broking me, um, basically saying that he felt the, the Christmas trading uh, was tracking well, that the US business was tracking very well. And then on Friday 9.45, they, they come out with this um, business update, and it goes back to the concept of you've got 15 minutes to read it. So the first thing I did was call up the two brokers who who's the ball in the bed. It's the first thing I did. And, and the bear came out and said, well, look, this is absolutely smash my numbers. The US business is tracking semi percent B, the, the um, Aussie business is 25% B. Unfortunately, the ball was on holidays, so I didn't get good at him, but I knew what he was going to say anyway. So, so that was the first step. The second step was the stock has been trading underneath 15 bucks for probably the last five, six months. Right? So it had consolidated, it had built a base, it had, um, i spent a lot of time um, you know, filtering through all this news and market volatility. Stock was matching above that huge level, that 15 buck level. And the final thing was that the short base was still 6%. So all those things to me were like a screaming, this is this is got all the hallmarks for a quite a strong move. Um, 15 bucks was my major level, it was matching at 15, 40, a very good volume, or something that might talk a lot about. So, so that's immediately got my attention. So it caps up, it holds, has a little flush. Maybe people like Nick trying to, trying to get along and has to fuck himself out. Um, he gets a little flush, and then it recovered. And then I could instantly see this new flow coming in. I actually bought the open, sold a bit on that flush, it regathered the open, I added. It went higher, I added. And I think I added my last portion at say 1570s, 1580s, despite the stock open at 1540s. Um, hit 16 bucks. I was offered at 16 bucks, I took some off. Uh, and and the, real, the real trade was, you could see this $16 level all afternoon um, being quite well often. Um, but every single time the buyers would step up, every single time the buyers would step up, it never dropped me we want. And the buyers just kept stepping up. And then about 1, 1.30, finally that uh, $16 lifted. Um, break volume, stock held above 16 bucks on that break volume. Volume of the breakout, as Mike really talks about. So that was the signal for me to go again. And that's when I once again bought some stock um, for that sort of afternoon, uh, 20, 30 cent. So that's how I traded that one on Friday. Hopefully that's 
That's no. good, yeah. And what about the curveball which came about three seconds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got stuck in some of that curveball. Um, and I don't care because it's something that Mike tells me, like, this is your best uh, trades. These are your rate plus trades. It had everything it was doing what I wanted. I wanted to ride that all the way. And the curveball happened. Um, they put the wrong percentage number on it. Um, shouldn't have made a difference, but stopped the momentum came out of it. And so I had to stop myself out of some. But I don't have any regrets. Uh, I, I don't feel there wasn't a reason to sell. Uh, I wanted to go for the quite a big trade there. Uh, instead, I just made a good trade. And then I think you held some overnight, um, and it gapped up again on, on the Monday morning, right? which is you know, where you made the second trade with Mike. Uh, right there to me. Okay. So how did you work your way out of what you were holding overnight? Or over the weekend, actually. Um, so I, I didn't take many home on the Friday night. Uh, I, I, I read a lot of the commentary, um, which obviously was positive, but I didn't feel like it was going to move the dial enough. But what we've seen of late is stocks that downgraded earnings have actually been going straight back up. So if you think about the bad stocks are going back up, you know what a good stock's going to do. Um, I think we've had a time in the market. My, my boss has been saying this, and I agree that. Yeah, there's been a lot of selling, and that selling's really been done. And um, a lot of selling's come, you know, it's, it's, a lot of the, the selling's dry up, right? And that's why these short stocks are, uh, are snapping back. So, you know, I saw it with Kogan, so I theorized, well, if, if the selling's done in the market, then these good stocks are going to get rewarded again. So I held a call, it, it gapped up above Friday's highs, so we added. Um, we played the morning dry, I sold some into a level. It dropped back into VWAP. VWAP to me is quite meaningful. It was holding, a print went up higher, which to me meant that I felt a buyer wanted to pay up the stock. So we rebought. Stock traded up to that print price. And then finally it started feeling a bit weak. And finally it started dropping the VWAP. So that's when I started cutting. It was quite dramatic on the sell off though, so I was quite late to cut those adders. But that was how I played that initial drive. And once again, I was really felt that there was a bit more behind that move because it was only day two. And I feel that stocks often drive in cycles of two, three, four days. Um, but unfortunately, I think that selling came in because it was announced that after pay would be in front of the Senate uh, today. And I think people were preempting. Some, some bad news there. So that's how we traded that example on Monday. And Mike was in my ear the whole time, and he'd never seen Aussie stocks trade, and US markets are so much more liquid. So he's like, don't worry, I said, just, if it drops two cents, just, just sell them all. I'm like, mate, I'm telling you, if this drops two cents, I'm going to hit it down 25 cents. And sure enough, that's what happened. But you know, that's, um, you know, it was a good experience. I felt like I, I went for the bigger move, but it didn't play out. And that particular stock at that time wasn't put enough of me to be able to exit how I wanted to. You mentioned BWAP there, volume weighted average price. Can you just speak a little bit about the significance that that plays in your trading, either price or maybe even like how your traders use it? That yeah. would be interesting. Well, I mean, you know, Austin is predominantly a, a momentum trader. I do do a lot of fading, um, which means counter trend trading, and particularly um, with VWAP. It tends to be a magnet, so institutions will run, you know, if they've got to sell a stock, they tend to be passive, they'll plug their big order into a VWAP algo and it'll run all day. Um, and so it tends to be a bit of a benchmark, um, and it's also a magnet, so um, with with fading and counter-trend trading, um, I generally do it between midday and two o'clock. Um, if you get a rip in a stock or a dip in a stock and it gets a long way away from VWAP, it's like an elastic there. It kind of has to go back there. Um, either VWAP is going to come down and the stock's going to do volume to drag down VWAP, which is a volume weighted average price. Um, you know, all the stock's going to bounce and head back up to VWAP. Um, the key with trading it within that time frame is that you're giving it time to get back to VWAP. Um, and so from a baiting perspective, um, it's a lot safer to do it in the middle of the day um, because you're giving um, you know the stock time to return to VWAP. Uh, you know, so the fading that's good. Um, if I'm trading with momentum, whenever the stock gets too far away from VWAP, 
I consider that you know the, the stock's done. Um, it's going to need to retrace to be what at some stage. So I'm always lightening up into spikes, um, or if I'm short, I'm covering into dumps away from B1. Because if it does volume down there, then you know inevitably it will snap back to B1. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that, Austin, or, or even more? Yeah, take it away. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's simply, it's pretty much the only technical indicator I use um, because I feel that institutions are often benchmarked to that, to that be what price. Um, if I'm at a US fund and I, and I fire an order down to Australia, you know, my benchmark's B1. That's the price I want. So over the day, please buy me CBA 50 million B1. So what I'm trying to get to is that if there is a genuine trend, if there's genuine demand, any any real um, institution who's executing orders are benchmarked at B1. So they're going to be trying to buy as many as they can as it gets back to them. If it dips below, they're going to get as many as they can to try and get that price better versus that benchmark. And I would say it's a very common benchmark for large institutional orders. And you can use this to, 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 try to measure your risk. I'm wrong if this drops me below. And you can use this to try and get gauge very strong stocks. Have you had uh, Brian Chaz on your podcast? Yeah, I think it was like episode 40 something. So a while back. Of course you have. <laughs> of course you have. It. I, don't, I shouldn't even ask that. You've had, you've had everybody on. Um, so he, for those of you uh, who don't know, Brian Shannon uh, at Alpha Trends. Is that right? Um, thank you. And so he does really good work on Miwok for swing traders. He will talk about using uh, two-day VWAP. He'll also talk about using anchored VWAP. So anchored VWAP is the VWAP from the event, the most important news event, news catalyst that has moved the stock. And those are really good things for you guys to go out and learn if you're a swing trader. Great resource. Great. Um, as we're in the first month of 2019, I think it might be timely to speak about maybe some of the things which uh, members of the audience can do to set themselves up for a great year ahead in their own trading. So, I mean, I think we've already covered some suggestions earlier on, and you know, feel free to reiterate some of those or um, you know, make some other suggestions and maybe, uh, I know, um, talking about habits is something you've been doing a bit of lately. So you want to talk about, about um, how we think traders can get better at 19 based on um, the markets and trading, or about the routines and the habits that that I have that to improve? Uh, if you've got some say on both. Well, I, I think what's very obvious is the increased volatility in the market, and that's going to be here to stay. And I think for everyone, it's it's taken people obviously by surprise. Um, and a lot of people, myself included, probably don't have a good enough playbook for how to trade some of these big volatile days. And I'm telling you, they're going to keep happening now. So something I work with my on and something that I'm very conscious of this year is how to trade gaps, how to trade volatility, the big US leaders. So we, we have developed a bit of a playbook about how I want to tackle that. Um, we did it last year and how we're going to do it this year. And I think that's something that a lot of people are going to need to do this year to get better. Um, so specifically, there's a few checklists. Mike's got an SMB video up, and I've tailored that to the Aussie market. Um, the checklist are things like such as this concept of uh, move to move. So when you have a big, bad overnight lead in, you know, just try and shorten your time horizon on your trade. Make it very quick, so a concept of, of, of move to move. Try and do less and focus on market stocks. So instead of you know doing things like broker down rates now or earnings updates, just focus on five or six stocks that are market stocks that you know are gonna move. And ultimately, they're probably the high PE stocks or the resource of stocks. So keep them focused. Um, the third checklist is really understand the big picture. So what's the big Aussie XGO level? What level matters? So say it's 5,000. You know, how does the market act in that level? What do I do for holds? What do I do for drops below? 
those are, those are three checklists. Um, the other one that, that Mike says to me, um, which is really important, is have fun on those days. Because often you come in, you're pulling your hair out, you're very stressed, and, and that leads to you not trading well. So have fun. Like look, We're meant to thrive in these volatile conditions. So if you are a short-term guy, like, try and enjoy that experience. Yeah, would you like to add to that one? Yeah, so in US markets, we had historically low period of volatility. So we use uh, measures for VIX. So when VIX gets above 15, we start to think about making market plays. When VIX gets above 20, we definitely trade the market. And across the board, there has to have been an adjustment for short-term traders to adapt to the different market conditions. Succeeding in a historically low volatility marketplace is a completely different type of trading than trading in a high volatility market. You have a completely different playbook for each one. It's actually much harder to succeed in a historically low volatility period and so, uh, ironically, we, we've had some, some guys who are really, really strong traders during a really hard period, but because the period is different and because it's so fast, it becomes, even for really strong traders, difficult to make that adjustment. And so, but it's, and it's a completely different type of trader. It is, you're looking at different stocks, you're looking at different indicators, um, you're trading essentially volatility. You're trading, and, and you're trading, as, as Austin said, uh, a shorter time frame, a shorter period. You're, you're trading volatility. And so, when you're in this historically low volatility, and you're used to holding things for a little bit longer, you, you can't do that as much. And, some of the, and so, you, you make those adjustments. And uh, yeah, not, not the easiest thing to do. One thing I, I left out there is um, one of the best trades that we worked on last year were basket trades, especially in these highly volatile gap down scenario days. And what that really means is you're trying to understand how the market is after the course of the day, and then coming into that afternoon session, uh, you're trying to put on a basket of stocks to join the market if, if it's really going to capitulate in the close, or if it's in really going to rally into the close overall, because that's often what happens in these in these um, highly volatile days. In the afternoon session, if it doesn't bounce, it doesn't bounce, then there's panic, and that that continues into the close. If the market's held all morning and it's recovering, recovering, then some of funds that come in go, you know what, that's a bottom. We're, we're going to buy this. So that basket trade is something that we've worked on. Um, so in my we created a spreadsheet. Um, whereby it automates that as much as I can. Um, and the big component of that really is, is one, having a setup, and two, buying the relatively strongest stocks if you're putting on a long basket, or shorting the relatively weakest stocks if you're putting on, yeah, on a short basket versus a long basket, sorry. Uh, and you can use any data you want for that, but what stocks are down the most, what stocks are on the low if you're shorting, what stocks are on the high, what stocks are up the most. Um, and that's a really powerful trade. Um, because you can manage risk very tightly, and there's a whole lot of upside if those, those new moments go. And there's probably been three or four of them that we've experienced um, in October, November, and I think we'll see a lot more of them going into 2019. Yeah, I think um, this theme of volatility, um, you know, markets being less liquid, um, will also carry across the earnings season. So, earnings season starts in February, and I think we're probably going to find the same sort of um, you know, ripping and dipping in, in earnings season as we have in the bull market the last couple of months. Um, interestingly, earnings season used to be my bread and butter. So two months out of the year, February, August, um, without a doubt, those two months used to be my best months every year. And as I started to grow um, my position size, average position size, I've really struggled to accommodate. They are no longer my best month. And it's because I'm trying to trade with the same sort of size and um, you know, markets get quite liquid and skittish, and you know, you often find, particularly with the large cap stocks, that um, you know they'll gap down, tank on the open, 
wow, this could be a trend to close. Uh, and then within half an hour, things reversed and then done this giant V recovery. So I think the trick is with um, markets that are typically more volatile, um, it's applicable to earnings season coming up, um, you can reduce your size, be more nimble, and just make um, one chop and move on to the next one, make that chop, move on to the next one. Um, if you're going to get a trend to close play, you probably best to wait till it settles and breaks lower again um, at 11 o'clock. Dr. Steenbart will say the volatility is your size. That is your initial size. As you mentioned, earnings, and it's coming up next month, well, I mean, some stocks are already reporting, right? Um, but it really does get underway in February. How do you prepare going into earnings season? Because it's a different sort of game, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, it's, it's pretty much my favorite time of the year. Um, and for me, once again, it's about knowing um, some of the stats on what happens to stocks that beat EPS consensus. It's about trying to track previous cycles about what, how the market does with um, with some of these companies that beat. So we've, uh, we've got some of the data there that, that helps me guide. Um, the most important thing I, I've found is um, being selective. So the days when you have maybe 15 companies reporting, you don't want to try and get across 15 stocks. You need to try and pick three or four that are most meaningful you, to you for whatever reason uh, and, and focus on those. And another subset of that is I really don't try and play these earnings too early in the day. Hoping that brokers might upgrade it or the street might reiterate it. I think in this market that trade might be a bit harder. You can sort of stay with SGM. Um, quite simply because you start to already move the lot. And I think probably there's, there's other value or people are looking to lock in some gains. So that's something I'm very aware of um, coming into this year. It's interesting that you say that because I mean, um, you know, previous earnings season, sometimes day two is, is your best trade. It was much more predictable. Um, so, you know, day two tends to be a lot less volatile. Um, you know, I think the big thing is preparation, you know, um, particularly come the middle of the month, um, they start to trickle in the beginning of February, and then by the 20th of February, you've got 25 different companies reporting, and you've got to select, you know, you line them all up in alphabetical order in order to put one to five open. And, um, you know, I think the hardest, I mean, I've taken on a, um, a training trader, and I think the hardest thing as a newer trader is to try and as the market's ticking closer to 10 o'clock and you've got these group one, group two opens, you, you can't be everywhere at once. Um, you really need to be able to select the trade that's going to work best for you. And as the audible changes, as it comes closer to the open, you're slowly um, building more conviction depending on how the order book is lining up. Um, so there's a lot of last minute um, you know, decisions that you need to make in terms of which stocks you're going to be in, where you're going to prioritise. and. Um, you know, you kind of need to be thinking on your feet, and if you don't have that skill set, as Austin said, you're far better off to sit it out and maybe only do one or two things on the open, um, and then, you know, when a stock's going to break a new low, break an opening range, um, that's the kind of thing that is more likely um, to um, continue the trend after the first, um, you know, 10 minutes of skittishness. I mean, institutions tend to not participate in that opening um, few minutes, they switch the algorithms on, you know, 10 minutes after the open, because, you know, the algorithm's not going to whip um, the stock around too much because stocks get more liquid after they've traded for 10 minutes. We, uh, oftentimes when guys are developing, will set limits on how many stocks that they can trade. I find that if they're during earnings season, people uh, do not judge properly how many stocks they can actually watch properly on an intraday basis. We had one guy who had an issue with overtrading. We set a stop for eight stocks max for him to be able to trade on an, on an intraday basis. One particular morning, I looked at his blotter and he had traded 15 different stocks and called him into the office and said, remember we talked about you only trading eight stocks. Why did you trade 15 out there? Well, really good setups, you know, it was a really active day, and he was negative in 14 out of 15 of the stocks. 
And, you know, I was a little bit like, am I really having this conversation? And so, but that's common. It's common for people to want to do too much. Trade four stocks, show that you can make money trading four stocks. You know, Boston is a very veteran skilled trader. How many stocks did we prepare for on Monday? Uh, oh. Five. Sorry, five. 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 Yeah, five. five stocks. And they have those, you have, you have five good ideas. And so if you're a developing person and you think that you can handle eight and you're not making money, drop it down to four. If you're not making money at four, drop it down to two. Get good at that first. Yeah, great advice. Now, things could very easily turn into a three hour conversation. Um, <laughs> But uh, as we've got just a little bit of time left, I think um, maybe we can do some Q&A. So, uh, does anyone have a question which they would like to ask? I was thinking about um, Shark, how he pretty much always draws down the want, especially on the front side of a stock. Um, but how does he recognise when he's wrong in that position because he's kind of going down the trend? Yeah, so uh, both of those guys started in the same class, and it's a really good example of how these guys came in, they went through the same training, they're trading the same stock, they're trading essentially in the same direction. They have the same thesis, the stock is up too much. Stock's gone from you know, four bucks up to 20 bucks, almost 20 bucks. That's too much, even in the US markets. Trust me, that's too much. Um, you know, news event wasn't real, massive short squeeze. And so uh, you have one trader who has the skill set of price. He is a active, fast thinking, intraday scalper. He does not like to take losses. He does not like to see open profit come back. He's a very, very fast thinker. Um, and so he is, while he is trading on the short side for the stock that's up too much, he's, he's scalping it. He's employing a completely different method. And so if he gets short and it's going to go higher, he covers it. And this is his skill. His skill is he has incredible bandwidth. And so he applies those skills and develops a trading system around those skills. And so. Um, he also has a tremendous amount of conviction. He's, he's somebody who develops a strong opinion and it helps him make a lot of money a lot of times. That, well, he's one of the pros of finding out the 330, um, especially examples home on Thursday, I believe it was. Um, so probably going to ask what's the sort of thesis behind that. And then secondly, um, with that same trade with Kogan, um, the, the, the second day play did trend on on the first day. Um, Austin's usually involved in sort of second day plays, things like that. So, one thing I did notice on Thursday afternoon was Hogan gapped up about a percent from the match, just, just didn't seem like there was any sellers coming in. So, is that something that is maybe a clue towards what happens next day? Whereas, then after play, the second day play didn't really turn out like Hogan did. Because he gets convicted, he likes to trade things on the front side. He likes to take risks. He's a natural risk taker. He, he just does not want to wait for the backside because he's afraid he may not be able to actually see the backside put in. And his thesis is this thing is already overbought. And so that's the way that he's attacking the market. Okay, and so he's always doing this with stops. And him drawing down $100,000 in a particular idea, well, it may seem to you like a lot of money. Um, and I could admit, as, as somebody who watches him trade, I'm not always crazy about the fact that he, he does that. But he, he uh, certainly when the stock turns, he makes many multiples of that. And so uh, you know, one of the things that we do as somebody who runs a firm is you want people to be uh, employing their strengths and encouraging them to employ their strengths as opposed to, and I was talking to somebody before this who went through training and they said, do this, do that, this is the only way to trade. That hasn't been our experience. Very important to match 
your ability with your, your strategies. Very, very important. And that's a, that's a perfect example of that. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? You've talked about traders that have gone from trading thousands, tens of thousands, up to a million, two million, and working their way towards 10 million. One of the common schools of thought is that if you set your goals too big, you end up making dumb trades because you're just chasing money. With that in mind, what's your advice on setting targets and setting goals? Should there be percentage-based, profit-based, or other things? So I like them, and Dr. Steenbarger uh, dislikes them. I like them because I think it's important to sort of say, I'm going to be a $10 million a year trader. Those are my goals. And then don't stop there. Put in a process that you're going to need to put in to actually get there. And so to me, uh, that makes sense to me to sort of say, this is where I want to be because it helps to shape the process and the process goals that go into that. So we're in no way saying you should just say to yourself, I want to make $10 million and stop. We're saying, I want to make $10 million because it just puts it out there. And one of the things that's really good about trading teams is that I mean, imagine being a junior trader or a semi-experienced trader sitting on a team where your senior trader says, who's, who's making a ton of money, is, is one of the really good traders on the street, is saying, I want to be better. I want to make $10 million, and here is the work that I'm going to do to get there. That is so inspiring. That's such great role modeling. And when you put it out there in a team, you're holding yourself accountable. He's, he's saying in front of all the guys in this team. He's, he's, he's putting it out there, and he's holding himself accountable to be able to start to hit those, those targets and do the work that, that goes into that. You know, obviously, in trading, all of this depends on opportunity set. Without opportunity set, you can't put up those numbers. But we do have that market where that opportunity is there. And, you know, it may not be this year, but the trade that you're talking about, <coughs> you're a couple guys with, with those targets. It is, I see no reason why couple of guys that are from won't get, won't, won't get there. All right, let's do one more question from the audience. Over there. Hi guys, uh, welcome to the listener, first time call. Well, questions probably more directed to Bryce and Austin. Um, I've been the same chat rooms and, and I've noticed Bryce said about well, he's one of the pros of fading up to 3.30, um, especially examples of on Thursday, I believe it was. Um, so I'm probably going to ask what's the sort of thesis behind that. And then secondly, um, with that same trade with Kogan, um, the, the, the second day play did trend on, on the first day. Um, Austin's usually involved in sort of second day plays, things like that. So, one thing I did notice on Thursday afternoon was Kogan gapped up about a percent from the match, just, just didn't seem like there was any sellers coming in. So is that something that is maybe a clue towards what happens the next day? Whereas then after pay have a second day of pay, didn't really turn out like Kogan did. Yeah, that's um, it's something that I really only learned by experience. I mean, I've taken some pretty big baths fading coming into the close. And the reason behind it, and I remember a specific example of LNG, um, LNG um, is a, a natural gas company, and they had a well, originally it was an import terminal, I think, in the US, and then they started all this fracking, and then it became an export terminal. Um, but this particular name, um, there was a US trader, a US fund, and you know when it's, when US institutions get involved, they they create momentum in the name. They come in, they produce the most aggressive algos, and generally. Concept behind this is that um, you might have a day order, and in that day, go to an X, like X amount of volume. And so, if they're tracking a little bit behind, this can go into absolute overdrive into the close. And so, as you see the volume pick up, he's trying to get his order, and um, you know, other people might join the momentum, and it creates a real rip up into the close. 
Uh, and so I bought badly in LNG, shorting it because it was so far away from the rewap. And I was thinking, this can't possibly continue. There was 10 minutes to close. Um, and it continued. It just kept going. I mean, if they're that aggressive at 22, 20 to 4 in the afternoon, it's not going to stop. Um, so fading up to 3.30 is just something, from experience, I've just been burned. I mean, if it's, if it's you know, really lifting off pretty well, going to be closed, pretty good chance it's going to continue. Um, and as you said, you know, it's pretty indicative of a gap up the next day. Yeah, I remember that, that trade quite well. Um, and, you know, as Bryce says, I, mean, I, I just don't fade poppy for this reason. Um, because, once again, it comes back to stepping back and trying to really think this particular one through. And luckily, the, the head of sales at Canacle was here, it's one of their stocks, and he was the first person I called. And he just said, look, this is a massive beat. Um, so you've got a stock that's been, you've got a stock that's been going sideways for months. Um, there's a high short base, and it's three o'clock, and it's holding its highs, and it's breaking out higher. You know why? Why? Why do you want to fade it? You know it's it's just a hard trade. Um, if, if you remember that specifically, there was a, a seller who just kept coming back at seventy. He kept coming back at seventy, and it was quite clear when he was gone, and the stock was holding higher at eighty. You know, so so you've got to think about the variables once again behind all these trades, which is one of the biggest lessons that Mike's taught me is, um, yeah, think about the variables and uh, the stock may be extended from VWAP, but as he said, as Bryce has said, this guy doesn't care what price he pays. He just needs to get another 100,000 shares on to report back to his boss to say that that bill is now done. So um, that's our answer to that one. And the second day play, I didn't actually go home long any that night because of that move into the close. Um, but it, it, it's exactly the same trade as what we saw in our company. It's what is the next level the next day? What what are the brokers saying? You know, how how's the market position? And as you saw, as soon as it busted four bucks, it was quite a simple 20, 30 cent rip there. Um, so I, I always advise everyone to step back and think about why am I doing this trade? What are the variables for this trade? All right. Are there any final words which you'd like to share before we close this out? Yeah, I'd like to say thank you, Anne, for hosting this. Um, once again, it's just amazing to see so many people with such a level of interest in what we do. Um, having Mike here has been uh, really hard, and for me and Bryce, a really special moment. So thank you, Mike, for coming all the way over. The original idea was that we were just going to watch the tennis and uh, Bella being so said, I'll only come if I can watch you in the office, if I can go see these guys, if I can have a talk in front of 300 people. So um, <laughs> so hopefully now we can just go and enjoy the tennis and have some fun. But um, no, but thank you, Mike. I mean, you are, for a lot of people here, a huge, a huge um, voice of reason and inspiration. So thank you. share with the trading community 
And Bryce, having talked to a lot of people in there, is sharing with the trading community. And Aaron has built up this amazing library of chats with, you know, elite traders. And of course, I knew you interviewed Brian Shannon because I don't know if there's anyone you actually haven't interviewed. Though one of my goals for 2019 is to get Austin actually to, to do an interview. That should probably be at the top of the list. But you all are part of the trading community. And, you know, this is, again, the result of three guys who are reaching out to each other and gaining value from each other. You know, co-op that. Co-op that. Build your own network. Reach out every day to learn something from somebody else so that you grow. Because if you do not grow, my experience in this game is that there's a result that you will not like. Go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the trading videos that we're producing for you in the trading community. And please add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video. From all of us at SMB, train and trade well.